Now we've come to the last two chapters of uh, Philippians, and I've just sort of added on, and then we're looking at 28 different things, and that's uh, not even looking at it in detail. But to give you an idea of how our lives uh, can be, and I think this is what we should be con considering, giving you due consideration. Well, let's begin in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for the joy that we can have in reading your word, being challenged by it. We pray, Father, that you will help us to make our life count for something. We pray that you will teach us how we can develop a life until we truly become vibrant, exemplary, in more ways than one. We pray for your grace and your mercies. We pray for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, all right. Well, let's take a look at uh, <coughs> the book of Philippians once again. Now, we take it into uh, the third chapter now. And I think that's important. All right, so in chapter 3 and in verse 9, where we talk, uh, where Paul talked about this whole idea. Um, and then phrase is, through faith in Christ, which is from God by faith. Now that's interesting to take note of what is through faith and what is by faith. Either way, it is faith. Right? Now, it's kind of hard to imagine. To many people, faith is, I, I really don't like this, right? a, a leap into the dark, which is not true. It really is not true. It's an it's a unfortunate phrase that the people have uh, developed over the years, and so it's like, you know, it's, really what we call liberalism. A liberal theology telling you, you can't really be serious, you can't really have faith. Listen, any faith is just a leap into the dark. That's rubbish. Seriously. For, for Paul, faith is a reality. Faith is sight. So you don't really, like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to plunge in. That is absolute nonsense. Because faith is never like that. Faith is where we say, this is God. These are His promises. And we believe in those things here. So where is the darkness part of it? You see, the problem is we take the way, oh, I just have faith, I'll just plunge into the, into, the, into the dark. That's not how it works. I think this is important. So no matter what, it, what we think it is, uh, this is the idea, but this is wrong. The real challenge, through faith, that's your means. By faith. Again here, another way of talking, employing it. Right? The both both ideas actually employ faith. The question is, how do we do it? This is very important. Okay? So sometimes we think in terms of, oh, I'm not sure how you will turn out. I hope you will turn out. <coughs> Therefore, that's faith. That's not faith. That's unbelief. So when Paul did what he did, there was a tremendous sense of certainty, a certain amount of tremendous sense of confidence. This is what we do. This is the morning's message about being confident in the Lord. So it's not faith in the wrong sense of the idea. Okay, so will, how will I succeed in, in serving the Lord? I will. And will there be fruit? Yes. This is not arrogance. This is just simply faith. And if we understand faith correctly, then we won't have difficulty. Because this is how, uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so when we look at all the exploits of faith, all the things that happen 
because we employ faith, then it just proves the point. Faith is not a leap into the dark. It's really a leap into the light. That is the difference between a conservative uh, theologian versus a, one who does not have faith in God. If our faith in God is real and it is strong, we have real no difficulty uh, looking at this very, very, very much. This is something that you want to consider. Okay? So we should be a great example, not that there will be no doubts or no problems, no difficulties, but faith still holds. Unfortunately, today, many people are plagued by their doubts, plagued by fears. <coughs> Instead of uh, having faith, they give in to their fears and they say, you know, faith is very hard. We keep on thinking of all the difficulties that our faith is very hard, it's very hard, it's very hard. But life is not easy. But so the, how do we do this? We exercise faith. And Paul is a tremendous example of one who exercised faith. Right? No matter what, it was just faith all the way. Then I, I want to encourage you. Look Hebrews 11, and you will see this whole idea of faith. Without faith, impossible to believe God, to please Him. Those who come to believe Him, we must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's it. That's our faith. And then we employ it. See, rather than to leave it to our own devices, when we leave ourselves to our own devices, nothing good will come out of it. That's how it must be. So this is faith as Paul understood it. True faith by faith. Okay? Now, this is something else next that we need to look at. And I, I really wish we can look at life in terms of knowledge. See, we often think, what well, I already know. Actually, we don't. You know, as we, as we know one level, then we go to another one. There are many mountain ranges. And you cannot say, I know this. That's it. I may have read, but I, that's not necessarily the same as I know. I read. But do I really know? That is a different question. Okay? So the question is, what is this knowledge? And here is the deeper knowledge all the time. See, we often are just happy with what little we know. That's it. Anything that goes deeper, we fall asleep, unfortunately. We're not challenged. Well, we should. So I think that when we look at life, when I was a teenager, uh, coming to know the Lord, <clears throat> I want to read as much as I can. So it was just extensive knowledge. Just read. By the time I was in my 20s, there was no story in the Bible that I've not read. Now, re reading doesn't mean I know. So I go deeper. So now in my 20s. Right? So by the, by the time I come to my 30s, um, I, okay, I have a very strong theological basis for everything I know, I read. I can say, okay, this is <coughs> theology of this, 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 this. Now I've got it done. In my 30s. Obviously, you've got to do something. But when it comes to the 40s, now that knowledge becomes something that I can teach with. So I set up Bible schools. I, I set up... Uh, I, I, you know, I train pastors, I train teachers, I, I, and so on and so forth. So, but see, that knowledge. Now in the 50s, okay, now, what do I do? See, I look back at it and say, is that all I knew? You've got to be kidding. That's really paltry. Now in my 60s, what else is there to know? A lot more than you think. Faith is no longer just faith. It's more than just reality. I look for profundity. 
I look for things which go way beyond what I think of. I mean, we've got to face reality of it all, right? So we are now in our 60s for some of us. And what do we do with that? Right? In a couple of more years' time, I will be in my 70s. And how do you look at it? And many people say, oh, are you, aren't you tired? Well, I'm tired. Knowledge is something that you now read and you can read it with understanding now. The Word of God becomes alive. It becomes open. You know, you never understood it before. Now you do. You say, wow. So I'm at an age where I can explain Isaiah a little bit more easily. I can teach Jeremiah like I read Gospels. Right? I, I hope you understand it. So there are lots of these things here. And our challenge must be, can I go deeper? Many people think, well, I already, I already read it. Look at it with disdain. Your mistake. It's like a new book all the time. Well, how do I understand this? See, so I'm really drawn to looking at deeper knowledge. And it's, I, I want to read it as if I've never read it before. You know, I, want, I just want to read it. Uh, I think that, that is, that is so special. Right? <coughs> so there's something that we want to uh, consider very much. Is it possible? Of course. Right? So the challenge is, uh, challenge is there. That I may know him. Wow. Not that Paul didn't know him. That I may know him. Sometimes we, sometimes we think we know a person. Actually, we don't. That I may know him. Do, I mean, we often take for granted, ah, he's always like that, ah, she's always like that, ah, he's always like that. Ah, she. That's our mistake. We actually look at it and say, well, God is not like that. You think you know. And then you begin to realize, actually, there are a lot more things I don't know about him that I may know him. See, that knowledge that I may know him and the power of it all. That is something that must come from knowledge. So I, I look at this, I want to know him factually, but I want to know him with reference to his power. What is this power that can come to me? That is a lifelong quest. No, I cannot tell you what it would be like next year. Who knows what will happen? One of our church members, the mother, just passed away. But, uh, two days ago, she wrote to say, uh, my mother is seriously ill. Can you pray for it? But it will <coughs> literally take a miracle because she's already in a coma. That's preparing her. And then suddenly, she wrote to say, you know, my mother just passed on. And she was only 67. See? And then you realize that, you know, I'm beyond 67. See, it can hit you any time. Right? So I want to know, what is that power? How can I live beyond where I am? Now, that, that's important. Yesterday, I was such a bad time of coughing. It's really quite bad. So, you know, when you cough really badly, you can injure your spine. So only people with spinal injuries will understand what I'm talking about. So there it is. So then they, oops, oh, then it became stiff. So I, yesterday I was walking very, very stiffly. So what's the best thing to do? Well, let, let me know the power of it all. Let me do what I need to do. I walk. Now I know you, ah, oh, you walk. Yes, it's the best thing to do, walk. I still cover my more than 10,000 steps every day. Of course. And in the walking, you know, okay, uh, the stiffness is still there, but I am a little bit more mobile than I was yesterday. Right? So if you look at me, you would not know uh, that I have got a stiff neck, pro stiff back problem. But, you know, I have, I have a surgery before. So you know how to control, you know how to hold your stomach in, 
you know how to use your muscles at the back properly. You constantly do it, constantly, all the time. So you learn. And that, that knowledge comes power. Power to live for the Lord, rather than just so one whole week has come and gone, just like that. And then next week, back to Singapore for a little bit, and preparing for a couple of weddings coming up. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's just moving at a tremendous pace. So then we've got a Christmas program coming up as well. There are lots of things that we must get done before then. And then there's a youth conference coming up as well. There's a lot of work. How do you find? The knowledge is there, but the power may not be. What happens if I only have knowledge but no power? Then what do I do? I look for that power that I may know Him and the power. But I begin here. So if I don't have knowledge, will this power come? No, never. That's why a lot of people don't have power in their life. You see their life, same old, same old. For what? I am not interested in same old, same old. Right? I can't help growing older. Sure. But if I grow older, I'm same old, same old. I died, I died long ago. And I am not dead yet. So you said, you know, you, you died, yes, 2019. But I actually died 2010. This actual death. But this is the other type of death. It was a person died a long time ago. What for? So there, we, so you see? So natural. So when we look at this power, and we talk about this uh, that's there, we go on further. Paul talks about these things here. And the fellowship of his suffering. Ah, and that's, that's really wonderful. It's interesting to see this. There's a, there's a, late, uh, there's a book called Heinz Feet and high places. There's an interesting example. It's written by an old missionary. Uh, she lived till she was 90. Then she wrote, it's just like Pilgrim's Progress kind of writing style. And she was talking about a lady. She was about, and her name was called Much Afraid. And, and the Lord said, I will give to you two companions. And they'll be your best friends. They're going to help you along the way. One is called Sorrow. One is called suffering. What? Why, who wants to have a... Why, why not joy and peace? Why... why and the, uh, ah, fellowship of his suffering. You know, sometimes it's only when you suffer. You appreciate God, his grace, his life far more than anything else. Every day you live happily, you will never sense your need for God. But because of suffering, you realize, oh Lord, I really need you. I hurt Steve right now. Oh, okay. And then you, you, you turn to the Lord. You cry out to the Lord. Okay, there we go. You, you, you see? So fellowship of his suffering, we identify with the Lord. And when we are able to identify with the Lord, we are so much stronger, wiser because of it. So there we go. <coughs> so that I may know him, power, fellowship of his suffering, conformed to his death. See, most of us would rather not die. But the Lord says, I want you to be prepared to die. And that's not easy. Right? So we, when we think of what one another, sometimes in in Singapore, we in, uh, on Sunday times, we have got this, always, uh, this, this column that says, what, would your, what do you think would be your last meal? What would you like to do? You know, what's your last meal before you die? You know, so you talk about this. <laughs> if you are really dying, you won't be thinking last meal. You won't be eating. You'll be barely drinking. You just... What a way to go, conform to his death, to die suffering for the Lord. Wow. That's not an easy thing to do. But that's a conform to his death. See, 
Most of us would rather not. We're just afraid of dying, afraid of death, you know, conform to his death. And the moment you are no longer afraid of death, you're freed. You're no longer afraid of death. You know. So what happens? Right? So this is something that we need to think about very, very carefully. All right, here we go. The deeper knowledge. One, two, three. Now, keyword three, uh, verse uh, number 18. Not that or I've already attained or already perfected, I press on. Now, that's interesting. The word press on uh, is an interesting word. It's literally this word. It's an interesting word. This word is a word that was used to describe Paul or Saul when he persecuted Christians. He will ask for letters of authority. I hear that some Christians are in Syria. Let me go to them. I'm going to bring them back. Well, that was how he persecuted Christians. Relentlessly. Really, with tremendous amount of perseverance, he just did whatever he did. Relentlessly. It was tough. Now, the same word is used. Right? So he says, I press on. Now, it, of course, you can't say I persecute my uh, development. But it, literally, you've got to catch the same energy. See, when, when people uh, want to succeed in life, for example, people want to study well in school. They want to do well in school. They study very, 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 very hard. But when it comes to the reading of the Bible, hmm, see, where is the effort? What is the energy? What is the focus? It's not there. Right? So if I want to succeed in my career, I put my heart and soul into my work. But it comes to pursuing my faith, ah, it's lackluster. That's why we don't succeed. Now, this is a secret. I pursue the development of whatever it is I want to pursue, whatever it is, with the same energy as I would. Right? This is something that we need to look at very carefully. How do we do this? You see, so if you look at Paul, why did Paul succeed beyond Wilder's dreams? Because he pursued the development of his faith, his life, in the way that he would have persecuted Christians in the past. So you'll find that you know, like whatever it is, some people, it's their hobby, they put it in uh, all their heart and effort, everything. When it comes to faith, eh, one-tenth of it. And then they hope to succeed. How is that possible? You ask any person who has succeeded in, in life, in work, and they will tell you, you've got to make sacrifices, you've got to work very hard, you've got to be very diligent, You've got to seize every opportunity. Well, why are those formulas not applied to our faith? You see, so we have two we have double standard. I want to work very hard. I want to get all the money because of my faith. And how come God never blessed me? Hello? Look, this is your problem. We're not pressing on. So I, I want to to do this, if I want to press on, I really must press on no matter what. That is the challenge of it all. Okay, so this is pressing on. Now, I, I need to move on because of the time. Okay, reaching forward. I do not count um, myself to have apprehended one thing I do. I reach forward. I press toward. Now, Yesterday, they had this um, <clears throat> Invictus Games in Sydney. I don't know whether you are familiar with the poem of William Ernest Henley. 
Okay? And they, they would recite this word. It's called Invictus. Invictus literally means unconquered. I'm unconquerable at Invictus. So this man called William Ernest Henley wrote this way back. Fighting uh, TB of the bones, Port's disease, it's called. And uh, it was, uh, so he was just saying, there'd be darkness, you know, but he says, you know, I am the captain of my soul. Uh, it's a lot of self. I don't know why people like it, but, uh, you know, it's just about yourself. And people uh, will, will, you know, I, I can recite this poem. I wouldn't even want to memorize it. I would rather memorize the Lord's word instead. Right? So this is important. But, you know, this becomes your Sydney games. So people who have got many challenges in life, uh, people who are paralyzed, and people who are older, and people who have difficulties. And so it's a big hoo-ha. <clears throat> Uh, Prince Henry is there, the Governor General is there, Scott Morrison is there, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Everybody is there, all the big wigs are there. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing over in Sydney. Invictus Games. See, a lot of people put in all the effort to be there, whatever the sport may be, and everybody think, wow, this is so wonderful. Yeah, but what do we, what about our faith? See, we don't. We look at it and say, oh, okay. We didn't develop a faith. Uh, develop your gifts. Uh, develop your work for the Lord. Uh, and then we expect the Lord to bless. Dream on. Not going to happen. The word I press forward, I reach forward is literally. It's a very physical expression. It's hand reaching forward. Right? Unfortunately, there was a story told of an Indian, uh, you know, Indian uh, king. And um, one day he fell into his beautiful pond looking at it, and the thing gave way, and then uh, he fell into the pond and he was dying. He was going to drown it because he didn't know how to swim. So he said, uh, <coughs> Give me your hand, my Majesty. Give me your hand. He kept on sinking. Give me your hand. So they rushed for and called the advisor. Advisor says, You cannot say, Give me your hand. He will not respond. You must say, Take my hand. Because he doesn't know how to give, he only knows how to take. Take my hand. And he was rescued. <laughs> See, this is what we are. We only know how to take. We don't know how to give. We'll take whatever is benefit to us. That's it. We got it all wrong. The real challenge is to look, reach forward. Let me reach. One more step. Let me reach. Let me reach. And before you know it, you're there. Right? So, uh, this is very, very important. I, mean, I just want to share with you how that I saw in my own life. And I can, I can say this now because I'm at this age. Okay? I wanted to build a church. And this church is going to be based on biblical principles. We're going to do it as we read in the scriptures. And we're going to do it no gimmicks, no, uh, no, nothing fancy, just follow through. And it took me literally 20 years to do this. This is just laying foundation, building the group, the church, until where we are. Then the next 20, the next 10, this is next 10 years, okay, we're now going to extend. See, so India, so 1989. This is 1973. That's how long it took before we started India. In the meantime, build every way I can. 
Right? I would teach three, four, five, six Bible studies in a week, reaching out to people, different groups of people, just build. And then the church began to grow. So after he's okay, now it's India and then Myanmar and then Perth, what else you gonna do? Nah, I'm not gonna stop there. Lord, if you want me to write, I will write. So I've written all the New Testament books except Revelation. Done. So working right now through the minor prophets, one after the other. Okay, let's work at it. Writing. And then, of course, writing commentaries is one, writing poetry is another, and still thinking of uh, how do we go. That Paul says, you know, I, I want to go to Spain, I want to go to Rome. <laughs> He's in prison, I want to go here, I want to go there. So I was thinking, uh, talking to uh, a brother from Kenya that uh, maybe next year, 2019, I will head out towards Africa. Who knows how the Lord will lead? There we go. Right? I, I hope you understand this. You see, it's reaching out all the time. You cannot from here go to Africa. It doesn't work. But first you lay the foundations. You go there, you go there. And before you know it, you are reaching other places. Okay? So there's no magic thing. It's just plodding all the time. Let me do this. And before you know it, you are reaching the world for the Lord. There's always been my desire, my joy, my dream. I'm literally living my dreams. That's how it works. Okay? So before you uh, grow too old, you cannot do anything, learn to do it now. Otherwise, it would, the, the future would never happen. Well, this is how Paul went on further. Okay? And then, of course, walk by the same rule. Now, that is important. So, I uh, maintain a certain way of walking, not just physically, but in every sense of the word. Right? Walk by the same rule. I have a certain, literally, a rule I walk by. <clears throat> right? What time I get up in the morning, how I will end the night, how I will do during the day. I walk by the same thing. So it doesn't matter whether I'm here or India or Myanmar or in Singapore, I apply the same set of rules. I walk by them. So this idea, do as the Romans do, doesn't apply to me. So if you're in Rome, do what the Romans do. No, thank you. I'm just going to be me. Right? I'm Singaporean and proud to be Singaporean. So in Singapore, we don't throw rubbish on the road. So in Myanmar, India, they say, just throw. And no, cannot. I will keep it in my pocket and I find an appropriate place. And I cannot. But everybody does it. I'm not everybody. See, I walk by the same rule. I don't seek to take advantage. I just don't. It's all why I want to come to this country because I can so wonderful advantages. I don't believe in taking advantage. That's it. Can't. Won't. That's not me. Same thing here. What are the things we need to look at? Right? So this is important for us to consider. What rule do you walk by? What code do you live by? See, many of us have not thought it through, but what, do you, what code do you live by? You know, I'm going to live by this code, and I am going to do it. That's how it works. Right? And it's wonderful to live by your own code, rather than oh, I'll see which way the wind blows. Wind blows this way? Okay, I'm going to go. Wind blows that way? Gonna, uh, what's the point? Right? So you, this is how Paul lived. And it's wonderful to see this. And you begin to realize, this is what the person is like. It's predictable. This is me. I'm very predictable. Because I'm going to do it every same thing. Okay? What time I get up in the morning? I'm going to get up. 
Okay, no matter what. Right? There's certain things I need to do each day. This is what I need to do to read. This is what I need to do. What I, well, just do it. Don't make a big hoo-ha out of it. But that's what it is. Well, that's how we do So as many as are mature, to the degree that you have attained, walk by it. You go higher, you walk by it. And after a while, you begin to live a very highly disciplined life, which is normal. Right? Now, I hope you will understand how Paul was an example. Let's flip the page over. Okay? Where Paul says, follow my example. Ha! Ah. Now, that is going to be quite a challenge. Okay? So, we're now we're looking at follow my example. This is 21 already. So, if you look at that, I don't... If I were to give you a test this morning, write the first 20 things about Paul, I doubt anybody will pass. Because we read, we forget. We read, we forget. No point. The real challenge is, okay, what is my life? Okay, am I an example to the next person? Now that's important. One day was a little boy uh, who went to school and they said, you know, kindergarten, and what's your mother's name? Mummy. No, 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 no. Why does your, uh, how do you um, call your, you know, call him mummy? He said, oh, dear. Because boy doesn't understand the mother's real name. Okay, then what's your father's name? Dummy. <laughs> because that's what the mother calls her husband, dummy. See, that's how children pick up. What's your father's name? Dummy. And you'll be surprised the footprints we leave behind. They are going to do what exactly we do. No matter how you try to kid yourself, but I, that, I did my best. Don't kid yourself. Be honest. A lot of times we fail them far more than we realize. Right? So here, the real challenge, be an example. That this is the whole theme of this book of, book of Philippians. We've been following this verse. Be, follow my example. So you have to ask yourself in prayer, in faith, in praise, in thanksgiving, and so and so forth. Wow, what a tremendous example that is. 22. Okay? Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, that is a question. Many people like to be, uh, what are you? I'm citizen of Australia, citizen of Singapore, small little town compared to here. And we all uh, take a note, I got to serve national service, uh, well, isn't it tough, isn't it hard? Yeah, it's two years, then plus reservists, another 20 years. What's that? Nothing, because if you love your country, I will serve, do my part. Obviously, whatever we can do, we'll do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Right? And before you know it, it's all over. And as we take a look at this very, very <coughs> carefully. See, but our real citizenship, now this is interesting. Now we seldom think about our citizenship, but our citizenship is in heaven. Later, in earlier chapter, Paul would say, conduct yourself, yourself. The word conduct actually is the same word as the word citizen. The word citizen is a simply politio, literally uh, is a noun form. The verb form is politio, and this is where we get the word politics, unfortunately. Right? So politio is a word... Uh, It's a word that tells you how you should behave. In other words, me, I'm Singaporean. Because I'm Singaporean, I speak in a certain way, I live in a certain way, I live in a certain way, and that's what. See, my citizenship affects me. Right? 
Same way, if my citizenship is in heaven, shouldn't my citizenship affect me the way I live? Now, so you ask yourself, uh, what is the spirit of Australia? So they took a picture, they took photographs, all those who are there, they wear Australian and all that. So Scott Morrison was singing very loudly, uh, you know, the national uh, anthem. And, it, and uh, some of them, although they wear Australian, they don't know the words, unfortunately, neither do they sing. What's that all about? See, you have a mixture. In Myanmar, <coughs> they still have this custom, use this old Singapore custom. Before a, uh, you want to go to a movie, okay, you pay your money, you get the ticket, you sit. Before the movie <coughs> starts, they'll play the national anthem of Myanmar. <laughs> and so one person wrote and said, how is it only a five, four or five people who stand up? How come the rest don't stand up? That came a law. And in Myanmar, it is now a law. If a person does not stand up for the national anthem, the person is liable to go to jail. Jail, three years, plus a fine, $10,000. I think a lot of people are going to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 they actually made it the point, and I, was, I read about this about two weeks ago. They made it the point. How dare you show such disrespect for your country? You deserve jail. You see, if our citizenship is in heaven, how much of the conduct of heaven do we actually see in our life? See, that's how Paul lived. See, he didn't live as a citizen of the earth. He didn't try to take advantage of people. He lived the way he did as a citizen of heaven. I really like this. So I practice this idea of citizenship in single, of Singapore and the citizenship of heaven very, very clearly, very carefully. I will do this. I think that is just absolutely <coughs> wonderful. Okay, so this is a tremendous example. Let me go on further. Okay, and um, the glorious uh, our citizenship, we have a glorious faith and we have a hope. And then... Finally, we look at rejoicing, rejoice in the Lord, which is, uh, he's been saying that. So now chapter 4, verse 4, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, it, chapter 1, he keeps on rejoicing. I don't know whether you can, <coughs> what time of the day can you rejoice? Right now, obviously, I don't see that much joy in the morning. Uh, will there be a time where the rejoicing will start? Please tell me. Because I see you in the night, it's not there. I see you in the morning, it's not there. When will the rejoicing start? At which time in the day does the rejoicing begin? And it's almost a never. What happened? You're too tired to smile? Yeah. Why are we, have we become like that? I mean, seriously, I mean, we, we take a look at the things here, but I, I, on the, I was walking on the streets one day, and there was this guy, you know, in, in, in America, they call them the bag ladies. You know, they just carry bags, plastic bags, and all that. I saw office works, one of his bags, this guy, this is a guy. Now, most of them are dirty, unkempt, and all that. Not this guy. It was pretty interesting. This is outside the courthouse. And he even had a dog with him. And he, you know what? He even had a tablet with him, connecting to whoever. 
and all he had was just bags. <coughs> Oof. But he seemed to be quite happy. Unfortunately, and now a lot of us don't know how to be happy anymore. What happened? What, what does it take to make you happy? A piece of chocolate? What would make people happy? Please go and buy happy chocolate. Give to everybody. What makes you happy? I mean, you know, here you have a, you come to church, you have a wonderful lunch waiting for you. When I, I mean, in Indiana, where the church I used to go to, you know, and um, when you are a speaker, a sign that you have done well as a speaker is somebody will invite you for lunch. If nobody invites you for lunch, <laughs> ah, that message didn't go down well. <clears throat> so you always get invited for lunch. Would you like to come for lunch somewhere? So oh, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. Because I was all alone anyway, so I'm going to have lunch somewhere. We come and have lunch. So they don't have very great lunch. They say, okay, uh, we're going to do uh, sandwiches uh, and, and a cup of coffee. Would that be all right? <coughs> of course. But you, you, you see what I'm trying to say? Where is the joy? Where is the rejoicing? I have been trying to tell you. Why? Why can't we rejoice? What makes, what makes, what makes a person rejoice? What makes an Australian rejoice? I've never seen a rejoicing Australian. I mean, really, wow. Very, very seldom you come across a, a happy Australian. You know, except the song, One's a Jolly Swag Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And then he's, uh, so he's uh, sitting by his, uh, his tree there and he's waiting for his billy to boil. And then that's it. And apart from that, there is hardly any real sense of joy. What, what happened to the joy? You know, you come to this country, when I first came to this country, you say, wow, the whole place is so big, wow. The air is so fresh, wow. The people drive, nice, ni drive nicely, wow. Houses are quite cheap, wow. Cars are, che cars are cheaper, wow. I mean, to me, that's every reason to be happy because this is what you have that we Singaporeans don't have, never can have. Right? If we want a bit more land, we go and reclaim the sea. <laughs> that's what we do. We want a bit more space, we go upwards because the air is free. We can't go down. We can't go anywhere else. And yet we can be quite happy. Why? What is the joy of it all? Right? I mean, seriously. So wh where is the joy? Don't lose the spirit of rejoicing. That is being exemplary. Let, let's go further. Okay, number 24. Finding peace through prayer. That is so good. And uh, another thing that we don't seem to have is... Uh, we don't seem to have a whole lot of peace. We are always troubled about something or other. We are always troubled about this terrorist issue, uh, you know, the cost of living, uh, this, you know, no jobs in WA. We, we are forever complaining about something or other. There is just no peace. Pieces, yes. We go to pieces. With peace, not really. What happened? Right? You have a, you have a good uh, army uh, looking after you here. Uh, you have got a lot of these things here. You've got, still got so much land. You are underpopulated. A small little city, Singapore. Five million people. And we look after, would you believe it? 20 million tourists a year. Wow, four times. 20 million tourists a year. They come to Singapore for whatever reason. We try to make it a hub of something, a medical hub, educational hub, entertainment hub, meeting hub, you name it. The word hub is all over the place. See, and, and we... Unfortunately, in Singapore, we take peace too much for granted. So from time to time, they will tell you, if you hear this alarm, 
please don't be alarmed because we're having a national exercise. Just in case there's a, there's a crisis. Singapore, when alarm goes, people are, what's that? Eh? They don't even know. Please go to the nearest uh, evacuation center. As if. Only if you work for the government, you might, work, you might go down there and turn out. The doctors and the nurses and the physiotherapists might turn out there. Nobody else would. See, we take so much for granted, unfortunately. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen to us. No, uh, you know, we don't have guns. Nobody's going to shoot anybody. Uh, you carry knife, it becomes an you know, illegal weapon. You can be arrested. You can be caned. Okay, nobody does that. So we don't think that it will happen. And that's how it is, unfortunately. If only we can find real sense of peace. Right? And a lot of people are restless. What's the next job? I can, must make more money. I must make more, more, more money. I, I must make more money. Uh, it's, a, it's a crazy <coughs> situation. It's never enough. So you talk about a crazy rich Asian. I, 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 actually, that's <laughs> no need to see a movie. It's there. You can see that, obviously. In, in, in Singapore, nothing, right? You crazy rich Asians, you can, you can spend just a simple dinner, you can spend a hundred dollars, just like that. Dinner, huh? Really? That's it. So can it go that way? If we don't be careful, we can lose the joy. We can lose the peace. Don't lose it, right? Think about this thing. Make a time for prayer. Go on further. Okay, learning to be content. I think that's one of the hardest lessons to learn. How many people you know are really content? Let's be content today. In our, our this, we have we always uh, don't know how to be content, <clears throat> right? So, you know, in the past, you just think if I have one million dollars, I will retire. Now in Singapore, Singapore has a uh, Huge number of people classified as millionaires. Okay, whether or not they are, you live in a, in a house, is already a millionaire. Uh, but that's how it works, unfortunately. So, and yet, are they really content? No. Always I must look for the next million. And then the next million. It's, it's terrible, but that's what it is. So old story told of Indian man, barber to the king. <clears throat> and he was actually a very happy man. That's why the king wanted him. He, because he'd come over, he made the king feel happy, cut his hair, <coughs> shave him. And uh, so the king always gave him, uh, every time he comes, every two weeks he will go in, uh, he will give him a gold coin. So over the years, he's, he's served very well. Initially, very comfortable home. Wife, children, really, really, really happy. Until one day, he met a genie. And the genie said, I'm going to give you seven jars full of gold. Really? Yes. What, what do I have to do? Nothing. Just take. Okay. Open up. First one. Wow. True. To the brim gold. Brim. Six jars. The seven jar, half full. No mind, I got six jars, six and a half, better than none. So he brought it home. That was when his misery began. He put in all his savings, put it into the last jar, half full. He began to sell all the things that he has, expensive things. Half full. Every day he was consumed. Why can't he be full? So he went to the king, looking miserable. He said, What's wrong with you? Every day you're chirpy, happy. Now you're not. So, you know, I'm, it's a money problem. All right, I will give you one gold coin. I triple it. Three gold coins every time it up. Just be happy. Oh, three coins are happy. Hey, put it into the thing here. Still half full. 
This went on for months. And then the king said, I know what's wrong with you. You met a genie who gave you seven jars, right? And the last one cannot be filled, right? He said, yes. How did you know? Because I had the same experience. That last jar is called the jar of desire. That as long as you keep on having desire in your heart for whatever, you'll never be happy. You never learn contentment. That is true. And so, so what do I need to do? Take all those things here and give it back to the genie. That's the only way. Let it all go. Desire cannot be controlled. The best thing is to give it up. Really? Yes. So next day, early morning, he went to the jungle down there and hello genie. Take back, I don't want your thing here. That the moment he was freed from me, he was a happy man. Never mind if his house is now a poorer house. Never mind if the <coughs> there's not enough food. Never mind if you're just happy. Contentment. A lot of people are not content. No matter how many millions they have, not content. No matter what they've experienced, not content. No matter what they achieve in life, not content. That is a serious problem. And we all know it. It's there inside all of us. The challenge is to learn to be content. I have a hope in heaven. <coughs> I have the Lord with me. I have the scriptures to read. I got great friends. God has given me life. He's given me more than enough. Why am I not happy? We should be, but we're not. Learn contentment. And it will really go a long, long way. See, that's why people, when took a look at in Korea, oh, Korea is the capital of Asia for cosmetics. You know, I doesn't, you don't have that double eyelid. Come, operation, no problem. $5,000, one eyelid. Never mind, we can be botched up. Never mind, they'll just do it. And then after that, your ear not so good, pointy. Okay, make it rounded. Your lips not full. Okay, make it full. What else? All the time. So a person can actually end up with 10 operations. You just save enough money. Save money. For what? You, who's that? Your parents cannot recognize you. And this, this is a very, very unfortunate thing. Right? So there was a story of this lady who went for this job. You know, and uh, she was spared from death. And uh, she was just saying, oh, I'm so thankful. You know, now I'm <coughs> recovering. I might as well go for, for transformation. So she was wonderfully transformed. And then as she stepped out of the hospital, a car hit her and she died. And then uh, she went up to heaven and said, how come I died? I thought I was going to, uh, you know, given a new lease of life because I was spared from death. He said, oh, I did recognize you. <laughs> you see, so sometimes we can go to all kinds of extents. This hits a little bit more ladies than men. But uh, it can swing anytime. There are people who like, you know, they, they, <coughs> I must have this, I must have that, I must do this, I must do that. Some people botox until they cannot s <laughs> permanent. You cannot, you know, because it's botox. I, I this is not like okay, this is botox here, botox there, botox here, botox there, botox now, until the face plastic. You don't even know whether the person is real or not anymore, because you can't. Right? People who are psychologists always read facial reaction. This one cannot read. <laughs> how? I mean, we just don't know how to be content. Why can't we be contented? Think about this thing, okay? 
Of course, you know, 26, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How wonderful to be able to have this attitude towards life. I can do all things. So this week, thank God, we can do all things. We survive a week. I survive a week. <laughs> thank God. <coughs> right? Not only that. Well, cough is still there. I'm going home with a backache problem. Thank you, Perth. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I can still do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why not? Rather than to grumble, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. why Pastor Chris asked me to come? You, know. <laughs> you can blame everybody. Oh, why? Wait a, a, a stupid thing, way, stupid way to go. What for? No, it's so much joy, seriously, in the Lord. Think about these things here. Of course, faith in God to supply all our needs. I think most of us worry like crazy. If I give this, then how? If I don't have enough, how survive? It's a foolish thought. Seriously. If God will supply all our needs. Okay? If we really exercise that faith in God, if we really pray, if we walk aright, it will always be see God supplying all our needs. If only we understand it. And finally, you know, giving God the glory. At the end of it, life's day. It is so good to be able to say, you know, thank God. Give God the glory, as we should. Now, I've just covered 28 different things here. And if we look at Paul's life, and say, are you serious? Is he, is he for real? <laughs> oh, yes, he is. And 28 is only 28 and counting. This is only in the book of Philippians. Actually, I, I could have added more, but I thought we're better now. We just... But it's scary to think about it. Can we? I mean, seriously, I, I don't know whether you want to be. Okay, out of the 28 points, how do you think you will fare? Okay. I don't think any one of us will have 28 upon 28. 100 marks. 100%. You know, very good. <laughs> the teacher will there. Okay. What's our passing point? Okay, well, let's, look, let's look, at, look at these things here. So we've got here uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so 13. Okay, we are looking at 13 mark, nearly 50%. Okay, 14, 50%. <clears throat> and we fail all of this 13. We only have got very little left, 15 to choose from. <clears throat> I fear very much that we would probably not even have 50%. Okay, now then it's a question of how far to the bottom are we? Now, to be that scary, what if we don't even come anywhere close to being an example? And we are sunk. Now, I hope you will think about this very carefully because whether you like it or not, we are already examples. It's really a question of good or bad. We are examples. You can't run from this reality. This question of am I good or am I bad? Am I good or am I outstanding? We are all examples. Right? So I, I'm, I'm going to invite you and you really take a look at these notes again and then ask yourself, tick off. No. When we talk about example, you must think in terms of consistency, you know. Not, not oh, on Sunday I'm an example. Then Monday to Saturday I am not. Forget about that. That's useless stuff. Consistency. Constancy. That is the true mark of being an example. Can you do it? The answer is absolutely. Right? As we allow Christ to work in us, this can happen. So that's what we're seeing in Paul. This is actually God working. First night, God working in him. Can God work in us so that we become wonderful examples? Yes. But it must be God's work, not our own. Otherwise, nothing will come out of it. Think about this. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the joy and the challenge to know our faith in you. Help us to appreciate 
that we can have this confidence that the work you've begun in us, you will complete it. We pray, Father, that you will help us to return to you, go back to what it means for us to live as we were meant to, close to you, exercising our faith, trusting you, praying that you will truly work a deep, great work within our hearts. Here is our prayer. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here.